Welcome to History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor, Greg Jackson, and I am very excited to have a special guest join me today, uh, the illustrious Dr. Kat Brown, a colleague of mine from Utah Valley University. Kat, care to say hello? Hello! Perfect. An excellent hello, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, to brag about you for just a second, uh, Kat ha is, uh, again, a PhD. Uh, her work was completed at Bowling Green State. She focused on Russian and U.S. policy history. Mm -hmm. So there alone, we know that you're brilliant. Um, <laughs> going on from there, you, uh, you've been at UVU for a little while. 20 years. 20 years? Yeah. My goodness, time flies when you're having fun. Exactly. Huh? Yes. So um, in that time, you've also been the chair of mm -hmm. history and political science. Yeah. And you are now the deputy provost of the university. Yes. Um, it is a very cool title. What on earth for those who are not in academia, what does it mean to be a provost? What should the listener pick up from that? Sure. The provost is the chief academic officer for the university. So he is the one, or they, you know, sure, randomly, yeah. are the one who usually he is, in our situation. Yes, yes, in our situation. Good old Wayne. Good yeah. old Wayne. All right. Uh, who oversees ultimately the policies that pertain to faculty and academics, uh, oversees the faculty generally, um, and is really in charge of the quality of the programming of the university. So it's low stakes. It's just low no stakes. big deal. No yeah. big deal. Yes. <laughs> and then my my deputiness comes from not just having the gold star, but also <laughs> having the ability to sign uh, documents that others in academic affairs can't sign if he's not around. Right. So you are the right hand woman. Yes. In, in the provost's office. Yes. Okay. Um, but today we get to bring you back to the classroom, yeah. so to speak, and. Uh, Get some Russia on. So yeah, looking forward to it. As am I. So uh, to kind of fill everybody in, uh, our last episode gave us a quick overview of World War One from its beginning up to the end of 1916, kind of teasing 1917, queuing up U.S. entry. That was super fast, though. Uh, I'm very happy with the episode, but I realized, oh, that, there were sentences that I wrote and thought to myself, oh, that could be a whole episode. But no, contain myself. This is U.S. history. Can't go there. All that said, the Eastern Front, I feel like you could help us understand Russia so much more. So I'm really grateful to have your expertise here today sure. to flesh out some things. Happy to do it. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get to it. Um 19th century Russia, going in, Russia mm -hmm. going into World War I. Um, as Winston Churchill would later say, um, that uh, he, he called Russia, I'm sure you remember this quote, uh, it is a riddle wrapped in a, is it a mystery, right? Wrapped in, in a mystery, yes, inside an, an enigma, enigma. something, yeah. right? We got mystery and an enigma in there yeah, somewhere. Exactly. Uh, I think that is pr probably a decent summation of how much most people know about 19th century <laughs> into 20th century Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for the typical HTDS listener trying to wrap their head around what Russia even is going into World War I, wh where should we start? What are some things we should know? So Russia at the time is the largest nation in the world, ultimately. It is huge across Eurasia. So it starts really in Poland and goes all the way east to what is now the Korean Peninsula. So it's enormous. <laughs> that is, yeah. How many time zones is that? Oh my gosh. Do, do you know? I think, oh, I think 13, 16, something enormous like that. Okay. And then it goes south, right? So it goes as far south as what at the time was Persia yep. to China or Mongolia. I mean, it is a massive country. And to think all of that, I mean, you've got the British Empire, the French Empire, territory that's oh, controlled yeah. around the globe, but this is all one connected mass. That yeah. really makes Russia kind of unique. It is, uh, because it puts places like Afghanistan right at its front door. So you have the British who really want to be in Afghanistan, want to want to keep it as they're moving northward from India. Yeah. And Russia's empire is feeling like, oh, no, this is really our front doorstep. So 
Britain? No. And I think your reader or your listeners may be familiar with the great game and yep. how Europe is competing for all this territory in Africa and Asia. And Russia is there, not as big uh, into the formerly unexplored European areas, um, but they're looking at places like Persia. They're looking at places like the Korean Peninsula, um, Afghanistan, and certainly the Caucasus. And they've got their eye on Turkey as Turkey is declining. Right. Yes. The, the Ottoman the, Empire. The, 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 the yeah. sick man of Europe. Yes. Yeah. And, yep. Those Balkans. Yeah. They get you every time. Huh? They do. And that pan-Slavism. Right. So, please, yeah, let's talk yeah. about that a bit. So the the Russian autocracy really saw itself as the big brother for all Slavs in Europe, and so as the Austrians are looking closer at the Serbians and the Bulgarians and others, you know, the the Russian government is looking at they're going, no, 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 they're our little brothers, just like there's Pan Germanism, we we are a brotherhood of Slavs, and yeah, you. Got to keep your mitts off. It's nice how that all fits well for empire building, isn't yeah, it? Isn't yeah, isn't it though? Yeah, yeah. nice and clean. <laughs> uh, did that predate much of the 19th century nationalism in in Russia, or is it blossoming and growing that pan Slavism idea right right along with uh, German nationalism and, and so right forth? along with the German um, the pan Germanism? Okay, yeah. So they're developing in tandem. Okay. All right. So we've got this massive empire. Uh, listeners might recall that they had a little uh, kerfluffle with the Japanese yeah. early on. That didn't go so well for Russia. No, it didn't. And that was a surprise for them as well as the West. So uh, why? Why did it surprise them? I, I think that because uh, Russia had done so well in the Napoleonic Wars, which well in air quotes, right? <laughs> it's it's easy sure. to do well when you force your enemy to have the logistic trains of potentially thousands of miles or certainly over a thousand miles. Um, but they, I, I think the West really expected Russia to be a lot more military, militarily adept than the Japanese were. And it, it's in, it's grounded in racism. It's grounded in mis- on misunderstandings with Japan and Russia. And so when Russia got majorly defeated, I mean, awful. If it was a sports team, it would have been a massive spanking. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think the West was, was really surprised. And the fact that the U.S. came in then and brokered the peace deal between Russia and Japan really showed how, how far Russia had uh, disappointed the West. So... Uh, I feel like this kind of takes us right into Russia's failure to industrialize. A oh, bit. absolutely, yeah. Um, is Russia fully grasping how far behind they are in industrializing? Yes, I'm shaking my head. Yes, which no one can hear. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, maybe if you shake your head hard enough, it might will... dislodge something. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, again, Russia is massive, right? To to get a rail line from one end of the empire, from the Polish end of the empire, right, to the Korean end of the empire, we're talking thousands upon thousands of miles. And in a country that does not have a well-developed mining system, smelting system, uh, all of those industrial basics, it's really, really hard to, to in industrialize something of that size. So even looking at just the eastern side of Russia, going from the Urals to the west to Poland, right, we're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of miles of rail line that would be necessary. And the Russians couldn't do it because they were an agricultural producer, which doesn't make a lot of money. And so they started borrowing money or inviting investment from the, the French um, investors, German investors, British investors, which then tied them more closely to all of the issues going on in Central and Western Europe. Ah, it sucks them in. It sucks them in. So just to kind of make a comparison point that I think will resonate with uh, people who've listened to a number of episodes here, the Transcontinental Railroad, I mean, that was a huge undertaking oh, yeah. for us. It was less than 2,000 miles, though. Mm -hmm. And so you, you just... I believe you used the number 10,000 as just a, 
just a general, not as a general. It down. But if you're talking all of the the feeder lines that need to go from cities of any substantial size yeah. into the main lines, we are talking tens of thousands of miles so, of rail line necessary. Transcontinental railroad times five, and in a nation that doesn't have the industrial uh, movement that had already Correct. been in place in the United States. Yeah, they were. Yeah. they're kind of screwed then. Yeah, would be a good. Uh, Nice academic way to put yeah, it. Yeah, that's a great yeah. academic way to put it. I'll put that in the next paper. I, yeah. write. I think that'll be the right way they to express it. They didn't have the chemicals. They didn't have, I mean, they, they were borrowing as much as they could in terms of technology from other areas, but it just wasn't fast enough. And because the ruling elites were so focused on being ruling elites, <laughs> <laughs> they, the, the investment necessary was just not taking place. So, focused on being really elites, mm -hmm. um, can we nerd out a little bit on sure. the? Oh, I love that enthusiasm. I haven't you said what, but yeah, you're whatever game. It is it's going to be. Yes, let's nerd out on it. Perfect. So, 1789, going back to the French Revolution, these ideas are mm -hmm. growing, spreading. Uh, the irony of, of course, uh, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, kind of becoming the mouthpiece to share ideas he's crushing at home. Mm -hmm. uh, they've spread throughout Europe. Uh, we have the failed revolutions of 1848. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we touched on those briefly in the Causes of World War I episode. Um, Russia, you, you do have uh, leaders that are basically successfully keeping that stuff, like keeping the lid on the pot as it's yeah. trying to boil over. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are always a, a, a few things that flare up, right? The peasants will get angry and start murdering the landlords um, in various areas. And not to put it lightly, because that <laughs> that, that takes money and time yeah. to then stop those those local revolts, right? Um, but there's also this th these weird series of rules in Russia where— the ruling elites cannot dirty themselves with industry. Mm. That that is something. The French did that same game. Yes. Yes. Right, and so that also keeps them from investing their wealth into the country. Oh my gosh, that's so backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it does allow them to go on trips to Europe and to buy great jewelry you can still sure. find online and things like that. But it doesn't do much in creating a railway line from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Which is what you need if you're going to keep up yes. with the industrializing world. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So here we are on the on the eve of, of World War I. Mm -hmm. um, we've got these alliance systems in place. Um, why... And I suppose we've just kind of hit on the answer, but here's the softball. <laughs> <laughs> um, Germany is ready to mobilize. It, it's got its Schlieflin plan ready to mm -hmm. do its KO knockout in, in France and swing back to Russia. Um, Germany can mobilize so rapidly. Mm -hmm. It thinks it can take out. I mean, I, I do just kind of want to let listeners absorb this for a second. Germany's convinced it can literally conquer a great power before Russia can basically get its pants on and out to the front. Yeah, yeah. And there was a good reason Germany thought that, because it was Elaborate, kind of yeah. true. <laughs> so to get troops from, let's say, Moscow or St. Petersburg to the front, remember, they, they have to go through Poland, past Poland, through, through Ukraine, right? right? All of those places to get to where Germany is. And that can take weeks. Oh my gosh. Because again, no, like no rails, like at all. Very limited rails. Not so enough that to move area an of army. Europe was, the, yes. Yeah. Um, because as you move the army, how are you going to move the food that feeds the army? How are you going to move the fuel? So those supply lines. How are you going to move the horses? Right. So yeah, those supply lines will then quickly burden. The, the it's not that there are a few railways. There are a lot of railways. It's just that Russia's so big in terms of square miles, it's not a lot of railways, if that makes sense. What, oh, 100%. I mean, and it's, uh, let's see, uh, can I get my 1980s pop culture references right? I, I believe, what was the line in The Princess Bride? Uh, uh, 
never uh never start a land war in eurasia yes but only second to that is this yeah. never never go against the sicilian when death is on the line right right right, right, right as he drops over dead um <laughs> but there's just so much land yeah and, and it's not easy land Right. Some of this land, especially in the spring and early summer, can be subject to rains that just turn it into muck. Ugh. Literally, horses can drown in the muck. You're kidding me. No. And it's not like, like, falling. we're talking muck that is over a foot deep easily. I mean, to go all 80s macabre again. So now we're to uh, the never ending story. We've horses are quite literally just disappearing into yeah. the. Woo, okay. Yeah. Kat, you're painting a vivid image for me. That's clearly speaking <laughs> to my 80s child mind <laughs> yes. here. Yes. Wow. Uh, and this, not that, I, I mean, this is so many steps removed from what we're focused on, so I'll be brief on it. But it also kind of highlights how does, how does Napoleon himself, mm -hmm. he can conquer all of Europe, but what can he not conquer? Russia. Russia. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we've we've got this massive empire that's super sucking at industrializing. Mm -hmm. um, Germany's convinced that they can basically just sit it out. And obviously, I'm being a little hyperbolic there. A bit. A bit. Uh, but uh, they're going to just go square France away, swing back over, all good. Um, getting deeper into the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, our, our dear friend, uh, Grigory Rasputin, uh, What's the role he plays? Where's the church, the Orthodox Church, uh, come into this? How much power does the, the Czar uh, Nicholas have? Uh, our, our boy Nicky. <laughs> our uh, boy Nicky. That's right. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Pa can you paint a little bit of an image for us here? So Nicholas II uh, was really not known for his leadership skills. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's like. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, at one point, uh, Wilhelm... <laughs> understatement of the day. <laughs> yes, understatement of the day. Uh, at one point, Wilhelm said of Nicholas, Wilhelm, the Kaiser of Germany, that he would have been a better turnip farmer. <laughs> and it was really hard to find anyone who would argue with that, at least quietly. Right. <laughs> um, right. It, he, he, was a, he was a very pleasant man. He loved his family a lot. But he was just not suited to running an empire at the beginning an of the 20th century. Autocratic empire, an no autocratic less. empire that yeah. was. This is lagging. not a ceremonial. No. Yeah. No, he did not. He did have some really good choices at the beginning of his um, sardom, so to speak, like Sergei Vita, who was excellent at seeing what Russia needed to do to industrialize. Once he was upset with his ministers and dismissed them, or the ministers died in in office, not assassinated, just we're not talking Stalin here. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're um, go ahead and clarify that. Right. Sure, sure. Uh, but once they, they just retired or left or what have you, um, he just didn't have the right people to replace them. And as the war dragged on, it became a lot harder to find quality people to replace them until so much that Nicholas became his own favorite general. Oh, no. And here's this guy who, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. This is my impression going back to my grad school days, but Nicholas is the guy you want as a neighbor and not as your leader. Yeah. He's like, more like the Ned Flanders. Yes. Oh, yeah. That is perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Heidi ho neighbors. Yeah. Oh, please don't invade me. <laughs> no, he never said that. In fact, he was the uh. one who got Germany to mobilize on the Eastern Front because he was also stubborn. And so when when the Austrians said that they were going to invade Serbia, yep. right? Nicholas is like, um, no pan Slavism. Yeah, so you're going off. to stand down or we're gonna mobilize. And then you know, the Austrians were like, Germany, they're gonna <laughs> mobilize. What do we do? Okay, we'll mobilize too. Tell them we'll mobilize too. And then in if your if your listeners have the chance to go to the Nikki Willy papers, they'll see the mobilization that both then committed to as a matter of pride. Yeah. And so Nicholas really stupidly takes on the Germans because he refuses to stand down. No oh. losing face. So a stubborn Ned Flanders yeah. at the head of a massive empire. Yeah, what could go wrong? Oh, nothing. <laughs> until, <laughs> yeah, until they start losing. 
I do want to give a shout out. The Russians did great against the Austrians. <laughs> okay, shout out noted. But against the Germans, it yeah, just so went downhill quickly. Let's go ahead and take a quick break and then get into how that went downhill. And we're back. So, Kat, Dr. Brown, let's, uh, you got it, you got it. Um, Let's, uh, let's get into a war with millions, millions of deaths just for Russia, as I recall. Oh, yeah. Just Russia alone. Oh, yeah. So, Russia is not only huge in land, it's huge in population. But the population is over 80% peasant, not farmer, but peasant, which means... Are we talking all the way down to serfdom? Yeah, well, serfdom is pretty much over. Okay. But the the folks who used to be serfs, some of them have gone into the working class um, such that it is in Russia. Um, but many <laughs> of them... I that qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> <Ish. laughs> okay. Um, most of them are still tilling the land that really... They're, they're paying off their landowners by still tilling the land. Um, we, we do not have a large land-owning agricultural class in okay. Russia at this time. And so if you can think about it, much of, the, mu- much of the attitude is, yes, this land has been given to us to farm, but it's not our land. So, so uh, just tell me if I'm wrong here. I mean, it, it does sound like it still has some echoes of yeah. serfdom. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not they, trying to push that. No, just, they 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 like, owe money for this land, yeah. and they have to work off the the money. The when emancipation happened, the serfs were given access to this land, but they had to pay more than the market price for it. Oh gosh! And some of this land is pretty nasty. Some of it's great, sure, right? But some of it is just marginal land at best. And so, trying to have a well fed well-trained military force that comes out of this sort of of environment is difficult. What they are good at is following orders. And sure. they're not. Ah, okay. Yeah. So re- the, the Tsar is not only the leader of all people, he's also the leader of the church. So he is the great papa. Uh, he will keep them safe. He will do what is necessary to protect them until they notice he doesn't. Right. Bloody and Sunday didn't no. go so well with this. Exactly. Line of thinking. Okay. Right. So that was the first Russian revolution, right? Back in 1904, 1905, where yeah. they revolted. Well, it's only been about 12 years until World War I breaks out, which as I get older is no time at all. <laughs> right. Right. It that, really hits you there. Yeah. Yeah. And and so the at first the the Russians are committed to this war as a people the peasants the the workers the elites the so I mean everybody is like yes Germany has threatened us we're going to take it to Germany and Austria we are a power right but because of that lack of industrialization it starts falling apart really quickly and because the rule in the Russian military is. Um, Peasants can't be officers. And wait, so you can have this like super competent, like yeah. brilliant soldier, and there's n- not going to be any way to promote, to move up. No. But what he is good at is building relationships with other soldiers. Oh, yeah. You're just setting up revolution here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so my goodness. in 1914, everything kind of looks okay. You know, yeah, there are some defeats, some problems, but. Over the next few years, it just gets worse. And by worse, what I mean by starting off as bad is in 1915, 25% of Russian soldiers did not have enough military equipment, as in firepower, to go up against the Germans and the Austrians. There's so, there's a classic scene in Enemy of, at the Gates. Oh, yeah. I, right? Please elaborate. I know yes. exactly what you're talking about. It is so... Uh. Right. Where an Enemy at the Gates is World War II. So it's yeah, wrong, but, it's... but it's right for 1915, <laughs> where right. one guy is given the rifle and the other guy is told, here's the ammunition. When that guy is shot and drops his rifle, you go ahead and pick it up and you keep shooting. I could not imagine. I'm... 
going into war without right. a freaking weapon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, maybe you'll have a sharp stick. I don't know. <laughs> but it's it's not a good look for the military. Yeah. And and as that Especially against industrialized Germany. No one's struggling to get right. weaponry. No. On the other side of those those lines. No, the America does not have a lend lease program. It is sending <laughs> the the European or the the Russian government. So, additionally, with the size of the front, you have to think about how much coal that takes for keeping troops warm. How much coal it takes for the industry of of war to continue. How much coal it takes to make the trains run to get the troops. To the front. So where is that coal that was helping out the civilian population going? It is going to the front. So now our peasants are freezing. They they'll have wood stoves and things like that. It's okay. it's the cities that start to freeze. Uh, okay. And and the workers start to freeze. And when we're looking at workers, we're talking about factories that may have fifty thousand workers. Right, all in close proximity, many of them sleeping in barracks with each other. And word starts to spread. Workers with family who have men at the front start to hear about shortages on the front, and the soldiers start to hear about shortages at home. So everyone's terrified for each other. Yeah, yeah. And they're starting to wonder, when is the tide going to turn so that the war can be successful? Because they believe in it. Right. Right. This is a holy war against these mm-hmm. Western invaders. This has got to go right. And it doesn't. And so what does this say about the leadership? And over time, this really starts to fall apart. And Nicholas isn't dumb, right? He may be, he may be too nice, right? He may be super nice, but he knows that the war is not going well. And so he keeps trying to replace his generals. But each one is as incompetent or as corrupt as the last one. And that corruption also skims resources off the military and out of the people, uh, the, the civilians. Right. And, and they are getting upset, really upset. It starts to be where food is getting harder to find because it's also going to the front. And if all the peasants are at the war, right, if all the male peasants are on the front, who's farming? Who is putting in the crops? Who's taking them out? So we start to see desertions too. People and they are worried s- about the family back home, the farm back home. Exactly. And they only leave long enough to maybe sow or to reap. Sometimes they'll go back. Sometimes they won't. But what does that do in the meantime? Yeah, you've got holes in, yeah. in your lines, in units. Uh, right. And meanwhile, you've also got the, the minorities in the West, because Russia's Western Front is our Eastern Front, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, You've got, we'll, we'll adjust what we mean when we say West for a second. Exactly. Here. You've got the Poles who are still mad at lacking independence. The poor Poles. like Oh, they get run over constantly. I, I have many times in class compared them. Uh, this is... I, I, I say it with nothing but respect, but I envision almost like a like a person drowning in water. The head like gasps up for air, like oh, independence back down, up for a split second, and then we're back to World War II, back down. But the problem is they're sta- well, figuratively, sure, they're standing on the Ukrainians, right? Because the Ukrainians don't even get that chance to come up every so often right. to say, "Oh, independence." Right, they are constantly being ruled from from Saint Petersburg, um, because at this time that's where the capital was. Right. Moscow was the industrial capital, so to speak, where Saint Petersburg was the the political capital. So the I appreciate you remind me. I know that when I do my when I'm writing things, and I'm <laughs> but right? yeah, that every time I read it as well, though I always go oh, right, 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 because those are the two important cities. So. Mm-hmm. Just the context of that. So the Ukrainians were also very much in favor of the war when it first began. But as the war rolls on and the corruption and not having any sorts of rights, they're also getting upset. The Belarusians are even getting upset. And and so you have these minorities in the West who are less convinced over time that the Germans are the real enemy. Uh Uh-huh. 
Because when the Germans come through, they're not always as horrific as, as they're they've told. Been told. Yes. Funny how that can. Isn't it, though? Go. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're great. Oh, right? no. Germany is no angel as it goes through these areas. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Kat, I, I don't know. never under the impression that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but the Russians and the leadership is so much worse. Wow. Okay. Um, as we talk about the Poles who have been conquered multiple times, both both sides, the Ukrainians and getting to Belarus, how deeply? Well, as we get into Pan Slavism, I guess I'm, I'm what I'm attempting to ask very poorly here is their separate sense of identity versus a Slavic identity. Mm-hmm. I think this is something that is perhaps very lost on us over, over here in the United States. I, all of Europe just kind of becomes a big blur in the eyes right. of most of my students is, is my experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, how deeply are these separate identities felt versus a a pan-Slavic identity? And, and how much might, not to get ahead of ourselves, uh, I realize things in the 20th century might further impact that. Right. But... I, I'm sure I've given you plenty of things. They're to all think very about. local. It's kind of like the US before the US was knitted together, right? Okay. That yep. they are members of their local community and everybody else exists, but it's out there. They they're not like waving a Russian flag. Right. You know, above their their little peasant hut. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're local. They yeah. they belong to that local land. They may identify with just a particular region, um, but they're not going to even necessarily identify with this pan German or pan Slav. Definitely not the pan Germanism, <laughs> but the pan Slavism. They're not going to look at the Bulgarians as okay. Those are my Slavic brothers. brothers they're yeah. like okay. I need to get the crops in. <laughs> I need to make sure that I can feed my family. Let's survive another winter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Was pressing, pressing yeah, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Funny how those things might go to the top of their list. Right. To worry about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, apologies for that little segue, but thank you. No I, I, I think that's worth uh, noting there. So, uh, if I could take us away from my my little inquiry there, back to our failing uh, leadership there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the czar is the leader of the church as well, uh, Grigori. Yes. What's what's his deal? Let's get into this guy. So um, Rasputin is a a holy man, self-professed, others professed. It doesn't really matter in the end because he was accepted as a holy man. Uh, He had a lot of influence on Alex, um, the the wife of the Tsar, on the Tsarina. Okay. And that was mostly because uh, they had a hemophilia or a son with a hemophilia, the blood disorder, right. who, and they wanted him Which to survive. Just very quickly means that, like, cut and don't really clot. It less. takes forever, yeah. And and so it seemed like Rasputin could get him to clot up, right? Uh, psychosomatic, whatever. I don't know sure. the psychology behind these but things. But he had them convinced. He had them convinced that he could protect Alexei. Until or Alexei, until adulthood, when you know maybe he could be cured. Even who knows? Right. Maybe through God. Um, but in in doing so, he Rasputin had access to elites, and he was a party animal. I've heard a few tales. Yes. Yeah. Uh... For a man of God, he certainly enjoyed his liquor and his ladies, and there. And, and, and that hard. lands well with a starving populace. Oh, doesn't as well, it? Right? Though that is already concerned about corruption and everything else. Yes, right. That this this madman perhaps is around them, and most peasants probably aren't that concerned with Rasputin, but the other ruling elites, the upper middle class, the industrial class, right? They who is this crazy yes. guy? Yes, and why does he have? So much power over the princess, the Tsarina. And she isn't all that trusted. Given no, her... she's she's German. Right. She's German. And we're fighting a German war. So she is seen as, wait a second, is she the enemy? Right. 
right? Uh, what, the list of problems here, exactly. it's, it's insane that all of this could be, yes. it, it almost makes me think like, how did the revolution not happen sooner? Right. How, how did they even make it to 1917? Violence, a lot of state sanctioned violence. Oh, okay. Well, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> but Nicholas also starts relying on a lot more on, on his dear Alex. And she starts to give him advice too, which only exacerbates yes. all of this. That a German woman that cannot be underscored at this time too, because right, right, right yes, is giving Papa Tsar advice about the war against Germans. Papa Tsar, who is not entirely trustworthy, there are chinks in the armor. There are, and then we've got this cr- crazy holy man. Yep. Yeah, and all of that connecting. So 1916, we do have. Mm-hmm. Russia's greatest success on the uh, in the war. Yeah, um, but there's some tempering. <laughs> some tempering. By the end of 1916, seven million Russian troops were dead, missing, or captured. Seven oh million. Right, an army is what a hundred thousand men at this time. Mm-hmm. I believe so. Seven. I'll put an asterisk there. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> to I check yeah. it out. Seventy armies. Yeah. Are gone. Or it, it, us here in the, the great state of Utah, uh, more than double our state's population. Yeah. Is gone. Is out of yeah. Not fighting. wounded. Mm-mm. Not laid up. Not able to continue not the war because home. they're dead. They're, they're broken in terms of physicalness or mentalness at that time as it was seen. Or they've been captured. And they're just gone. Well, you know, Kat, I always appreciate how uplifting and joyful our conversations are. Thank you. you it's know that. part of my uh, my style. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, <laughs> well, I'm glad we could inject some little levity in, into, <laughs> into all this. So now that we've just discussed the disappearance of 7 million souls, uh, yeah, there's. it doesn't matter how much territory you regain nominally. That Mm-mm. You can't spend that. No, having a couple battle wins, you're still losing a lot of yeah. a lot of men at yes. this time. Perific comes to mind. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is of course going to take us into revolution. Let's go ahead and take a quick breather here. And then when we come back, it's time to uh, overthrow the czar. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. All right, we're back and uh, revolution time. So yeah, Kat, where where do we need to begin? Let's let's. Well, we can't start with a revolution unless we have a little bit of unrest, right? Revolutions just don't pop into existence. You don't do it because you're bored, right? Yeah, right. There's usually some reason. Yeah, you got to go outside. You know, (laughs) who wants to go? Especially in Russia in the winter. In the winter, yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah. So what we start to see in um, well basically throughout the war, but really starts to take off in 1617, is the soldiers and the um, the workers start striking. So remember, I mentioned the workers are in like these concentrated fac- factories, and they're even in barracks, and these cities are full of workers, and word spreads quickly. So in October of 1916, just in Petrograd, which was renamed, so it wouldn't sound so German, right? There were 250,000 strikes, strikers, right? Okay. Men and women participating in strikes. A half, a quarter of a million people <laughs> in one enormous. city are striking. That's huge. Yeah. And with that quarter million people come rumors. Come, oh, tra- sure. you know, transgressions of some sort, felt, real, perceived, doesn't matter, right. right? These are people who are getting angrier and angrier. And and the troops that used to be around to put these sorts of things down. They're all a little occupied at the front. They are. Not only that, but when they do come back, they're like, uh, this is some major BS. Right. Because their their family members are saying, we don't have food. We don't have coal to heat our our little stoves in our apartments, in our flats, and that we may be sharing with many other people. We're freezing. You're really going to, you know, 
you're, you're going to stab us with a bayonet because we're freezing to death? And the soldiers uh, are like, nope. No. Thought it over. Yeah. Not going to. No. Especially when you have, you know, family members writing you letters over the last several months of, this is a problem. We're dying. And we can't get food to feed the kids. Right? These are people who are at their breaking point. And this has been simmering then in the soldiers' heads for yeah. months, years. Years in yeah. some cases. And so the conditions are worsening, and the the government doesn't know how to respond. And the the Tsar has this, so there's the Duma, which is the the legislature that is supposed to help advise the Tsar. Okay. But he doesn't want to listen to them because he thinks that they're going to tell him things he doesn't want to hear, which yeah. Because well, always good leadership when you put your <laughs> right. head in the sand because you don't yeah. like the feedback, right? Exactly. Solid play. <laughs> Solid. Yeah. So the doom is like you you have to do something. And eventually it just gets so bad. There are so many losses that the Duma starts to convince the Tsar that stepping down in favor of the Duma would be a great idea. But what really happens then in February in Russia's time. Russia's not on the Gregorian no, calendar. No, they're not. They're 13 days behind. Right. So it's March our time. So I'll, I'll keep using March so people don't get confused. Okay. But by March, people are getting so upset. The doom is like, you've got to do something. You've, you've got to let us take more control. The real breaking point was when women started to revolt. And, and working women were not uncommon in Russia in the factories, right? We see this in early industrialization in a lot of places. Absolutely. Um, and these women have to do the work. Their, their menfolk may be away at war, so they are also the ones standing out to get the food. They're, right. they're doing it all. It's factory work, single mom after that. Yeah. And, and they can't get bread. And bread in some of these working areas was making up 80% of their calories. So no bread means certain starvation. Right. And so the women started revolting. And when women started revolting, people really started to perk up. You know, not, uh, again, to not make light, but when you think about, I, I don't know, it, it makes me really grateful when I think about us living in, an, in a society where we can worry about things like, I'm avoiding bread because I don't want right. the, the, the carbs, right? <laughs> right. Here's a world where that truly bread, well, it almost contradicts the, the biblical yeah. claim that man does not live by bread alone. Apparently, in a few corners. It's the staff of life. <laughs> in a, yes, in a very literal way. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So getting, getting the Tsar to give up power became a huge belief throughout Russian society. And because the the workers and the soldiers were the, well, the soldiers certainly understood violence. If they've been taught and trained, right? I mean, yes. And and they had used, had had it used against them, right? The, the Russian army was not a gentle place. You couldn't hand them a stress card and say, please be nice to me, <laughs> right? That yeah. doesn't happen. Um, and the workers a lot of discipline in, in the factories as well, right? They are fed up. And so their revolts get worse. And this unrest forces Nicholas to abdicate. And he abdicates on behalf of his son as well, because his son is too young to... Make that call. Yes. Yeah. And so to take his family out of power, he abdicates in favor of his brother, who is like, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hot potato. Don't yes. throw that to no, me. No, 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 what are you no. doing? I, I think I'll just call myself Mikhail Romanov and just go from here. Thank it's you all very good. much. Yeah, yeah we see, don't need see this. See the family reunion. Yes. <laughs> you and Wilhelm. Let's, yes. yeah. It'll be fun. And abdicates in favor of the Duma, who is really made up of a variety of people because there were no free and fair elections in Russia. It was not one man, one vote. Yeah. It was, you know— this many workers had one vote. This many peasants had one vote. Mm. You know, it, it was not a democratic sort of thing. But the Duma, to their credit, kind of got that. And so they started bringing in other folks and uh, trying to take the elitist stink 
off the Duma. Okay. And they created the provisional government, uh, first the provisional committee, and then the provisional government that said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to transform to a democracy. We're going to have a constituent assembly at some point, and we'll have an... We're Western facing. We're going to make right. this work. We're, I, I hear yes. little French undertones right. all over this. Yes, yes. exactly. But uh, but this isn't liberté, égalité, no, fraternité. No, this is an enormous, starving, blood-soaked nation, and they're in no mood for grand platitudes. Right. They want to eat. They want. The war to be over. They want their men folk and some women folk. There were some female soldiers at this time. Really? Yeah. Different story, different day, right? Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, you got me. Uh, women show up in militaries all over the place. That people don't know or think about, but yeah, like like a million brief, holy. Together. Okay, now, that's in various roles, right? But including some combat. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Different anyway. story, different day. Yeah. But okay. Okay. So so the. The provisional government also had a friend known as the Petrograd Soviet. And the provisional government had all these elites in it at first, plus a a socialist, maybe two. I can't remember exactly. Okay. Um, but the Petrograd Soviet was made up far more of people like Mensheviks and Bolsheviks and socialist revolutionaries, all these different types of socialists and communists. So I, I realize, oh, this is a, a, a tall, impossible ask in like a, a mere <laughs> one question, one response. But maybe rather than even trying to get into some of the distinctions, please feel free to do so. I'll just highlight or we can highlight. Sure. It is the words communist, socialist, both historically and even into the present, they get thrown around as synonyms when they, yeah, that that th- it doesn't quite. They're emotional fit. words, yes. right? Uh, they they've become quickly emotional words, but at this time they were all different types of Distinct. adherence to right. these concepts of Marx or other socialists and communists Bingo. at the time. Yeah. So there was no monolithic socialism and communism. There were all these different flavors. Perfectly put. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Anytime. And <laughs> and Russia was kind of like a Baskin Robbins of socialism <laughs> and communism. It had many flavors. You walk around, but... get your free sample. Yeah. yeah. You had the socialist revolutionaries who were committed to peasants and the peasants owning the land. You had the Mensheviks who believed that there had to be a capitalist revolution in Russia before there could be a socialist revolution. You had you even had different flavors among the Bolsheviks. Some who believed, okay, maybe the Mensheviks are not quite right but a little right to the hardcore, no, we can just make a leap and go right into socialism under the right conditions. Because Marx had been dead for a while at this time. Yeah. And so all of that ability to kind of think about mm, what really Mm -hmm. fits anymore. Right. Play with the text, interpret in different ways. Yes, exactly. And so what we what we start to see is that that Petrograd Soviet is trying to be a shadow government of sorts to this more elitist provisional government. But what happens over time until we get to November, October, their time, Mm -hmm. that revolution is the provisional government becomes more and more radical. And the Petrograd Soviet becomes even more radical. So by July of 1917, mm-hmm. the the Petrograd Soviet is being dominated by um, Marxists, particularly Mensheviks. Uh, and the Petrograd Soviet becomes far more Bolshevik and left-leaning socialist revolutionaries. Okay. Because even among those, there are... There are many flavors. Right. So in April, part of the impetus for that had been, okay, so you have the revolution in February slash March where yes. the, the Tsar steps, steps down. It goes to this new form of government. The people are like, okay, this is going to change the war. It doesn't because, man, Russia is too tied to the West. They owe the French so much money. 
all that back to the railroads, yes. infrastructure for decades. Yes. And they're receiving entreaties from the Western governments. Don't get out of the war because we can't have the entire German army on the on right. our right uh-huh. Western We can't front. absorb all we that. We can't do that. France and its dinky population. Yes. Yes. And the British and the Americans, uh, not quite ready, right? Yeah, yeah. I was still thinking maybe yeah. we can just sit this bad boy out. Right. Yeah. And so the they're like, please, please, we don't care who's in power, just don't leave. We don't care. Right. And and so the provisional government is like, okay, we're, oh, we're oh, this hurts, but okay, we're committed. We will honor the commitments. And then the Petrograd Soviet and the little baby Soviets running around that are being formed in all these other cities to uh-huh. help. Kind of decide. incubating. Yes. They're getting their printing presses going. They're getting the word of mouth out. Like, we don't have to fight this war. This isn't our war. This is an mm. imperialist war. And when Lenin comes back in April. And where's he been? Switzerland. I'm, he's not skiing. I don't think he was a skier. <laughs> um, I never got that impression I didn't from either. him. He I feel he's writing. more of a snowboarder. <laughs> That's no. I think he was writing. Okay. I think he was doing okay. a lot maybe, of writing. Maybe writing. Not writing, but writing. Writing. That, yeah, we got to get yes. that sharp T there. Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. Good point. So, you know, there's there's the story of did Germany import him intentionally in, or uh-huh. did they just kind of go, hey, Lenin's in that train car, just let it go. <clears throat> that's, Who knows? It's chill. Just right. But that's like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What matters is he ended back in the fin, you know, the Finland station, and he he came in and started writing his thesis, and he had the April theses. The the grain of the revolution was there because he's writing about how the war needs to end. So for peace, the people need to eat the bread, and maybe the peasants need to have a little more control over their land. Those three Those key three things. Key so things. real quick, real re- recapping, make sure everyone's following. We, we have two revolutions in 1917. Yes. We got March using our Gregorian calendar. Yes. We got very March. appropriate, by the way. Isn't it, though? <laughs> Always been a fan of the Gregorian calendar. It feels a very strong one. <laughs> so, makes sense. So um, March, now it's April. Lenin shows up, drops his thesis. Three great hits. Yes, and things are, are fomenting, right? Because yes. the provisional government isn't keeping the war together. Magically, the war tide doesn't turn because they want to be more democratic. It just mm-hmm. gets uglier. And there's this special little thing called Order Number One that comes out of the Petrograd Soviet that says, you don't have to obey the officers you have. You can elect your own officers. Do we now come full circle to the smart and capable and popular peasant soldiers? Or? Oh, man, if he's alive. Oh, What okay. you come full circle to in many cases is the smart, capable peasant soldier who says, hey, if you elect me, you can go home. It's a strong platform. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that landing. Yeah. P- perhaps particularly with the guy who's like, still like a gun. Yeah. Still I'm like still a gun. still waiting for my <laughs> Hi, guys. Just anything. <laughs> yeah. Handgun's fine, really. I, you know, I could beat him with the stick. That's what I got. So, yeah. <laughs> and that really undermines the army. Okay. Because most soldiers, I mean, we're, we're talking millions have deserted by this time as well. Millions are gone. Millions are deserting, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently. Right. And everybody just wants to go home. And we'll figure it out with Germany. And they've gone home now schooled in the arts of war. Yeah. Which... And they're, they've either gone back to the factory or they've gone back to their landowner's land. The landowner, was he at the front? <sighs> right. Was it, I don't recall seeing him there. And when I did see people like him... They were giving me the crappy jobs. And not a gun. And not a gun. Yeah. Or really. Apparently, I found the refrain. I was still like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Or a crappy gun. Right. So, so this just gets worse. The July days. The, the government shows it cannot control, the provisional government cannot control the direction of the revolution. And the Petrograd Soviet is getting stronger and stronger. And the incubating Soviets across the, which just means council. That's Soviet means council. These workers and peasants and soldiers councils across, especially Western Russia, are just getting stronger and stronger because they have a consistent message. The more they radicalize, the more consistent their message is. Right. 
And so, and by the way, such a small side note, but thank you for defining Soviet. Oh, no I, problem. I, I, I think there are a lot of people who probably, oh, that's what that means. Yeah, it just means council. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I won't get into that. But sure. um, the, the government did try to do things. They basically said freedom of press, which meant now all those very radical presses didn't have anyone shutting them up. Right. So they now said, it's just... Pfft. Yeah. Yeah. Civil liberties for everyone means you can't lock up the people spreading the, the the news you don't want spread, right? All of those very Western ideals, those democratic ideals, really come in and bite what is a war torn nation trying or a war torn government trying to instill some sort of order. It can't be done. And by October, it's getting cold again. If any of your listeners have ever been to Russia, it can start snowing in September, right? October can be very bitterly cold. You need heat. You need food. Where are the crops that the Germans have taken because they've been marching through Poland and Ukraine, right? right? And again, the women start to revolt. And it just... Basically, the Bolshevik government then says this or this provisional government or not provisional government, the Petrograd Soviet says, this is the right time. And we get to and, revolution number two. Yes, but it's really more of a coup mm, because right. the revolutionaries go into the Winter Palace, into the dining room to arrest the provisional government, which is now headed by socialists. So you'd think there'd be some... Professional courtesy. <laughs> but no, Kerensky, the great lauded Kerensky, the West is like, he's a great democratic man. He's a socialist and he's recently escaped. And they don't capture him, but they capture a lot of other leaders. And voila, the Bolsheviks are in charge, along with the SRE, the socialist revolutionaries. But it's the radical section that is now in control of what then becomes the revolution because you got to have two sides sometimes for a revolution. And so okay. who's the other side? It's the remnants of this autocracy and the remnants of the provisional government and what is democratic values. So that's when the revolution starts to happen. And the, the, the Bolsheviks come in, along with the, the Essaries. We don't want to make it sound as if they're the only ones there. They, they later got rid of them. That's why they're forgotten. <gasps> yes. Convenient. Yeah, convenient, yeah. Convenient. W- worked out. Yeah. And the the Bolsheviks basically, along with the Essaries, say, hey, our goal is peace, land, and bread. Stop me if you've heard this, right? Mm-hmm. Lenin has it. And Lenin wasn't the clear leader at this point. He had He had— People around him still saying, hey, we're, we're not ready for this. We have fewer Communist Party, Bolshevik-type communists in Russia than they do in Germany. Now, I knew they were a minority, but that had never struck me. Yeah. Holy cow, really? Yes. So there are only about 50,000 Bolsheviks and their allies in Russia at this time. The bureaucracy of government has millions. Oh, wow. And so what do you do? You chop off the top, but you have to keep the rest of it. And so the bureaucracy will end up having this very Russian nationalist flavor. But the Bolsheviks already had a little bit of that, too. And there we go, huh? And there we go. And, you know, peace, land, and bread. Peace is first. Right. So out out of the war? Uh, what what they, they try to help the West understand. They're like, look— we're going. We're going to try to fight this as best we can. We're just. We're, we just can't put up very much. We have to feed our people. And the West is like, no, 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 no. You have to stay in the war. And the Bolsheviks are like, we cannot honor that commitment because first, it's an imperial war, and second, our people are they. They can't do it. Right. And the West is like, you have to stay in the war. And the Bolsheviks are like, okay, you're not listening, so we're just going to have to at first say, we're just not going to resist the Germans, which is an invitation to please hmm. keep walking through our land. Yeah that's, a, yeah, that's one way to handle it. Three miles a day just on horseback? Sure. Wow. No problem. But there's Some real jealousy from people on the Western Front, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, Trotsky did try. He became quickly the leader of the army. He had been a Menshevik, then became a Bolshevik. Okay. So he tried, but there, there just was no will among the people to fight this war. They really wanted peace. And so the Russians start to leave the war. And that only makes the West unhappier because they want the Bolsheviks and their allies to honor those commitments. And they can't. They, the provisional government couldn't do it. What makes them think that the Bolsheviks could even if they wanted to? Right. And so the, the West— w- Wishful thinking, right? right? Just like, oh my gosh, please don't leave us with a one-front war. Yes. Yeah. And where do the Germans go? <laughs> toward France. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Why not? Right? And the of course the US gets involved then and blah yeah. blah blah. But the the Bolsheviks are also their their goal is to get the the government, the people just quieted again. You we're not going to force the landowners to give up their land yet, but those who are occupying the land, the peasants who are occupying the landlords land, we're not throwing them out. And so the landlords are like, what are we supposed to do? And it's like, we don't care. <laughs> it's uh, not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an issue, not that's, an issue. Exactly. Yes. Same for the factories. The There are these little cells of workers that will sometimes take over the factories. And the factory owners are like, what are we supposed to do? Again, <laughs> not our problem. Right. But over time, it becomes very repressive. And over time is a very short period of time. It's within months. Yeah, that's rapid. Yeah, yeah. So geologically, it's like a blink, right? Oh, 100%. Of course. So what then happens is the revolution happens when the other side, the the pro-provisional government, the pro-liberals with the small L, Mm -hmm. right? The pro-monarchists, the... All of those start to say, no, 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 we have to oppose this because we we need to keep our land. We need to keep our factories. We need to keep Russia. We need to conserve Russia the right. way it was before the war. And the Bolsheviks have no intention of doing that. And this is where we get into a civil war of sorts. Yes. The civil war and revolution are inseparable. And meanwhile, the West is still like, oh, excuse us. <laughs> can, can you guys seriously hold down this front? <laughs> if, if, could, could we also have the loans you owe us? Because oh. this war is really expensive. And the Bolsheviks are like, are you kidding us? You have got to be the biggest jokesters on the planet because we can't even feed our people right now. We don't have a good shortage in Russia right now. We have a goods famine Right. When I was in the archives in Russia, in Moscow, okay. they were writing orders on scraps of paper that were two inches by two inches because there wasn't enough paper to run the government. And they were writing wow. it from the center outward in a circle and then flipping it over and doing the same from that side to fit the the business of government on what little literal scraps of paper there were. Holy crap. So, oh this, my gosh, Kat. So, and you've handled and I've handled and this at these. stuff. Yeah. And so, immediately, the Bolsheviks start cracking down on borders and imports and exports and, and trying to get food into the hands of people, um, in the, especially in the cities where the workers are because they want, they want to reward their people, but they also want to keep the cities quiet. And so as the civil war develops, it means that they're going to take the grain from the peasants without necessarily paying for it. And that creates enemies in in the peasants and means that maybe they like the white guards that come through rather than the red guards. But then the red Uh guards are mad that the peasants supported these others. And oh, it's the peasants' lives really, they already sucked bad. I don't. And like somehow they actually managed to get worse. Yeah, yeah. The it was just being a Russian peasant. Ugly. Just never a time where you you look at that and go, yeah, well, we can romanticize that. Yeah, era. no one wants to reenact Russian peasanthood, <laughs> right? Because it's like we'll just live with somebody's boot on our throat the entire time. But sometimes it's a different boot. And yeah, I, I hear changes as good as a break. <laughs> I don't know, because I think the Bolsheviks were using the same boots in many cases. Ah, fair, fair, so I guess, that yeah. The, that the imperials, uh, imperialists had right. used. But this also means with the loans not going to the West, right? The West starts to really see the Bolsheviks for what they fear them to be, which are 
They are not allies. They are not good Christians who will help us prop up the Russian government. They are out to undermine the West. And, I mean, yeah, that's part of Lenin's whole thing. He thought that there would be revolutions that would spread to Germany, which they did briefly then. Yep. Right? That it would spread to all other areas. Went to Hungary. Why? I mean, for for the West at this time, the French— the, the English, the Americans, they are looking at what's going on in Russia and going, holy crap. Well, and to, by all means, correct me, jump in, but to fast forward just a titch, yeah, uh, we do eventually get American, British, French troops that even go to Russia. Oh to my support, gosh, thank right? you, yes. Being a native Michigander, I, I'm very touched that you brought that up because the museum to the American Expeditionary Force in Russia, yes. the headquarters is in Frankenmuth, Michigan, Christmas no Town, USA. Really? Oh, yes. Well, that's all you need, right? Right. Like Christmas and they sent all museum. these <laughs> they sent all these men from Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota because they quote Oh no. Got the cold <laughs> and quote. They could handle the cold. Sent them to Russia to allegedly guard the equipment that the West had provided uh-huh. to the Russian government, um, but also to maybe show some support for, you know, the the non-Bolsheviks. Right. But all they did was convince the Bolsheviks and the Bolsheviks' audience that, oh, this is an external threat, too. And so we're planting the seeds now of this yes. growing, this, in- this incubating baby that is about what will become the USSR. Yes. And we're planting the seeds that the US and company are the great enemy. They're out to get us. And how do we know? Because they invaded us. And meanwhile, right these out the poor gate, men one. from Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota are literally sitting in places like Arkhangelsk, freezing their posteriors off Right. Like this is supposed right. to be analogous to the right. Somewhere there's there's some some guy from Massachusetts or New Hampshire going, I right. dodged a bullet. Right. Glad they latched Northern onto Maine those other. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, I look at how my dad handles Michigan winters, and I'm like, I don't, I still don't think he would take an Arkhangelsk winter now. Right. I don't think so. So yeah, and they're sitting there. There were letters going back like, we had to make boots out of dogs. Which for our dog lovers out there, I'm really sorry. Um, but that was not uncommon among Russian peasants when their their beloved uh, shepherd of their their animals died to turn them into something useful. But yeah, the right. the men there are literally freezing oh my gosh. and having the worst time. The Czechs are there. The Japanese are there. This is all self interest, right? The Japanese are thinking, hmm, we mm-hmm. lost or we won that war, but we could maybe get a little bit back or a little extra into right. our, our own empire. So, you know, and the West is hoping that, hey, we'll show the Russians that we're friends and they'll flock to us. And they yeah, that's and super not the message. That's super not the message at all. So, uh, to my goodness, we've we've gone a little longer than than I expected. You're such a great guest. Kat. Oh, thanks. I'm uh, having fun. Good. I <laughs> am too. So I am going to press just a little bit more if I can have sure. your time. So how does this then, we just touched on Americans in Russia and how that's going. Yeah. What's going on back in the United States? Is there a response to the rise of the Bolsheviks in yes. Russia? Yes, there's a famous phrase, and forgive me for not remembering who said it, but it's communism was the ghost that stalked Versailles. So while, while France especially, and Britain to some extent, wanted to really squeeze the Germans. Oh, and forgive me just real quick, because uh, we haven't gotten to that point. Oh, For my sorry. listeners, no, it's, it's no, no spoilers. It's all okay. good. But Versailles, uh, the uh, great chateau, the, the palais. <laughs> the of, little cottage. That's right. Uh, in, in France, um, where we recently listened to uh, Otto von Bismarck put a, put a crown on a, yes. on a Wilhelm. Mm. Uh, this is where the treaty will be hashed out after World War One. So... That's what Kat's referring to. Yes. Kat, so, please. All, so all of these representatives are there. And while they're looking at Germany going, okay, we cannot let this happen again. Spoiler, they did. Um, <laughs> it's really, what can we do to make sure we don't hurt Germany so badly that we turn them over to the Bolsheviks? 
And the Bolsheviks became the scary boogeymen of, of the Western world. And for good reason, right? At this time, the Bolsheviks then are starting to crack down on the people that had been part of the previous government. I mean, they are, there's a secret police, the Checha. They are rounding up people. They are disappearing people. Masses of Russians are emigrating to the West and to places like Chicago and New York, which freaked out a lot of Americans as well, um, because there's no future left for them under this Bolshevik regime. Uh, some of your listeners may have watched Dr. Zhivago, where he comes back to the city and there are multiple people living in these old palatial homes. And yeah, that's going on because there isn't enough living space for the workers that are in the cities. Uh, it's it's horrible. There's cholera, there's dysentery, disease Ugh. takes over in the winter, right? It is getting bad. And so the West is looking at Russia going, we cannot let that spread. We have to contain it. It's not the containment theory right, that I'm sure right. we'll talk about in several weeks. Well, yeah, we'll a few get to weeks. that. Oh, we're, f yeah. We're th a few weeks? Oh, that's a bit. Oh, that's, a bit. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. A, but yeah, not. But yeah, let's contain it. So let's not kill off Germany. And the the West is terrified of those ideas then spreading because America had a working class that was sometimes a little bit upset. Remember the shirt, you know, the shirtwaist, tri the triangle shirtwaist factory yes. fire and these sorts of things did leave a lot of American workers feeling like the people who, who ran these factories and the government didn't care. And so they could be ripe for Bolshevism and Emma Goldman was, you know, there, yeah. there were legitimate reasons these, these ideas were feared. And so this would end up going into the first big red scare that the U S ever faced um, under the Palmer raids and others in the late, eight, uh, late 19 teens, early 1920s. And yeah, America was terrified of what was going on. The labor movement in Britain had some links to that as as well, right? To these socialist principles and not identified with the Labor Party today. It's completely different right. really than it was then, but they were far more radical and forgiving of, of the Bolsheviks uh, methods back then. But uh, yeah, a lot of the Western areas were just terrified. Whew, well, Kat, I feel like that's the exclamation point. I mean, is there anything that you think we need more? I, my goodness. Well, no. I mean, part of the exclamation with an asterisk, okay. the Bolsheviks were nationalizing land and factories in 1918, which meant that they were willing to take them from the owners. Right. And that scared the Americans and the Western capitalists as well. And this is all cooking as we get to the end of the war. And hence, yeah. it's the ghost at Versailles as all yes. of that looms in, yes. the, in the eastern distance. Mm -hmm. I got my north, south, east, west correct there. Yes. All right. It is eastern. Whew. Yes. Yeah. Just, <laughs> you know this stuff on a map, and then you're talking in a little dungeon basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Cat, thank you so much. Anytime. This was a blast. It was. I really enjoyed it. This um, was a lot of fun. And of course, if you want to take a class from Cat, you're just going to have to enroll at Utah Valley University. It's true. I'll be teaching this fall. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I'll be teaching this fall. Nice. Isn't that great? Yes. What are you teaching? Oh, that sounds like a problem for fall. No, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be teaching uh, my, my Middle East course and doing some capstones. Ah, I'm doing genocide in the 20th century. So many uplifting topics. I, Again, I know. Cat, always, I'm just Dr. Just, fun, right? <laughs> that's what I think. You, uh, you're just great at parties. You know, Thanks. Yes. Yeah, just, I, yeah. If you need someone to start winding it down, I am your person. <laughs> so, Kat, what do you do? <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, all seriousness, one more time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. History That Doesn't Suck is created and hosted by me, Greg Jackson. Special thanks to today's guest, UVU Deputy Provost, Kat Brown. Production by Airship. Sound design by Molly Bach. Theme music composed by Greg Jackson. Arrangement and additional composition by Lindsey Graham of Airship. For bibliography of all primary and secondary sources consulted in writing this episode, visit htdspodcast.com. HTDS is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. My gratitude to you kind souls providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. 
Amanda Bragg, Art Ling, Ben Kelly, Beth M. Chris Jansen, Bill Thompson, Bob Drazovich, Brad Herman, Shannon Stewart, Charles and Shirley Clendenin, Chris Mendoza, Christopher Cottle, Christopher Merchant, Christopher Pullman, David Aubrey, David and Holly Cottle, David DeFazio, Durante Spencer, Dex Jones, Donald Moore, Henry Brunges, James Black, Janie McCreary, Jeffrey Moots, Jennifer Magnolia, Jessica Popic, Joe Dobas, John Frugal Dougal, John Keller, John Redlevich, John Schaff, John Schaefer, Juliana Taper, Karen Bartholomew, Kristen Kenny, Kyle Decker, Lawrence Neubauer, Liz McNeil, Logan Hilbrand, Mark Ellis, Matthew Mitchell, Melanie Jan, Michael Umbright, Mike Healy, Natalie Brewer, Nick Naboda, Ogade Khan, Paul Goringer, Rich Miller, Rick Brown, Robert Asenzi, Sarah Trewick, Sean Pepper, Scott Slaymaker, Sharon Thiessen, Sean Baines, Sue Lang, Creepy Girl, Thomas Bug, Thomas Stewart, Tisha Black, Todd Kine, Tony Hurst, Victoria Bennett, and Zach Jackson. Join me in two weeks where I'd like to tell you a story. 